Welcome to this live wire thematic discussion. My name's James Marley. Today we're talking China. I'm joined by Tim Chung from Morphic Global Asset Management and Kevin Bertoli from PM Capital. I've got a couple of questions that came through our uh, channel. One of our viewers particularly interested to find out what's going on in China. Some great questions. Um, Tim, listen, we might kick it off with you. Uh, very mm -hmm. topical this week, we saw rates come down for the fifth time in, in six months in China. Mm -hmm. um, your views on uh, where rates are headed, but mm. more importantly, what do lower rates mean for the Chinese economy? Well, I think, yeah, as, as, you, as you know correctly, so over the weekend, uh, the benchmark lending rate went from 5.35, 5.1. Um, at the same time, interestingly, the government sort of did something unusual, or well, not that we see all the time, which is they increased the benchmark at which the deposit rate can spread over that from 130, 150. So what they're really saying is, we bring rates down, but we're giving banks some room to compete. Um, we think this is very positive. Uh, we think it's a very positive development. Um, we've already seen over the last 10 months, you've had 10 consecutive months of th those rate cuts being translated into the mortgage market. So we saw a stabilizing property uh, market. Where's it going now? I think there's another 50 to 100 basis points you know, for the next year. I think that, and that's roughly in line with consensus. Okay. Kevin, direction of rate movements aside, what do lower interest rates mean for the businesses and the people on the ground in China? What, what, what is the actual outcome of this? Uh, the reality is, I think you've, if you actually look at where we are with rates, I think the important message to, to kind of take from what, we've seen, what we're seeing is that there's significantly more room that the government has to move. I can't tell you where rates are going, but I know that if that data continues to uh, remain sluggish, which the data is still sluggish in the mainland, you will con continue to see uh, more rate cuts, I'm fairly sure of that. And you actually look at the, you know, the momentum or, or the news flow that comes out uh, from the, you know, the central government, it's very much driven around you know, the rhetoric of maintaining uh, a positive underlying kind of sentiment uh, of the marketplace. So I would expect rates to, to probably come down. I can't tell you, you know, where they, they go precisely. Um, but in terms of the corporates, what we're seeing uh, from the guys that we cover is that they need that room to, to basically improve the balance sheet. So that lower rates is, is, is going to help significantly. In terms of uh, 25 basis point increase or decrease impacting mortgage uh, demand, I actually don't think that's going to have a very big uh, uh, impact at all. I think policy around things like down payments, uh, etc., have a, have a far bigger impact than a 25 basis point cut there. Okay. So, are we likely to see um, the impacts of these rates? Is this uh, a case of alleviating the debt burden for companies and individuals, or is it actually like to, likely to result in a stimulatory yeah. sort of response in, uh, the, uh, in the economy? I think if you look at Chinese history and you know, the history of the marketplace, the rate cuts haven't been what's driven the marketplace. It's been broader stimulus, um, you know, reserve rate cuts, um, changes to mortgage down payments. They're the things uh, that I think are going to have a bigger impact on, on driving demand. The, the reality is a lot of these banks are pushing up to their reserve rate requirement limits, um, which means it's difficult for them to hit government loan quota, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think those things uh, are what's going to drive underlying demand uh, as opposed to a couple of rate cuts here or there. The rate cuts to me are more about the sentiment of the underlying investor. Um, and maintaining uh, the kind of status quo. You look at, uh, you have a down day in the Chinese market. It's the corresponding thing that you see uh, is positive rhetoric from the central government. The central government is in a critical position here. The economy either goes one or two ways. And for them to stay in power, for them to maintain the status quo of, of the system that they have created, uh, they need um, positive underlying sentiment. Tim, we were talking offline before about <coughs> the um, the quite incredible run up we've seen in the stock market mm -hmm. in, in China. Yes. Uh, what, in your view, is this a bubble or is this is there something more to how this what's stimulating, what's causing this level of interest in the market? Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, as as we like to say in house, I'm sure Jack has told you guys before, a bubble is a uh, bull market that you didn't take part in. Um, so we, we're definitely taking part. So we're not going to be calling it a bubble. I think, um, I agree with Kevin, I think that there's a few things that are very important. Um, one is around September of last year when things started to run up, um, you had this confluence of, of PEs being very cheap, low single, uh, sorry, low double digit uh, PEs for the broader market as a whole. You had banks, which are the biggest part of the index trading at a P2B price to book of 1.1. 1 
and ROEs in the high teens slash low twenties, then you had the government come out and very aggressively say, "Hey, we 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 think the market effectively we think the market's cheap." Knowing that the retail punters are going to be the first people in. Now the retail punters are the first people in, but why do we think it has legs? Is the second people in? It's the institutions. So the Chinese government is embarking on the audacious policy of trying to deleverage through re-equitizing. So by, by basically, instead of cutting debts, they're going to try to increase the equity side of things. And so, and so while the Chinese government is, is favoring that direction, there's going to be volatility along the way, but that's, that's sort of the, the wave with, with which we would like to run. Okay. Um, and, and what do you make of, of comments, um, official comments, that the Chinese economy needs to go through some short-term pain on, on a transitionary, you know, transitory path through to its next leg of growth? Oh, look, it's absolutely the case. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got two bits of transitory pain, or well, three bits, but I'll, I'll focus on two. The first is that investment as a proportion of GDP is basically two times too high, and retail spending or consumption, private consumption, is half as much as it should be compared to the rest of the world. So the, the economy needs to rebalance, and you can't do that overnight, even though you have big SOEs running large parts of the economy, you need to allow innovation, you need to allow the 10 cents, the Alibabas of the world to come through and provide things that people want to consume. The second bit, and the more difficult bit, and, and Kevin uh, pointed, pointed this before, is, is staying in power. Um, the other big part of imbalance is the wealthy have gotten really wealthy. And somewhere along the way, the middle have been doing well. I mean, you've got to give China's credit where credit is due. They, they've created the largest middle class in history. Um, but there are people falling behind. And, and really, the corruption clamped down, um, cutting civil service wages is on the side, and they're increasing them through formal mechanisms following the Singapore model, that's what all this rebalancing is about. But it causes a lot of pain in the short term, um, in the economy, but not so much in the uh, share market, as we're saying. Okay. Kevin, we'll finish up with you. Um, just sort of bring it back for domestic investors or Australians, just to, to have a think about how they frame the, the conversation around China. Is, the, is China a bit of a, on a bit of a muddle through, but generally a continuing growing trajectory? Well, I think they've been in that muddling through process for a couple of years in, re in reality. Um, but I think the comment is right. When you're trying to transition what is essentially the second largest economy in the world to one that is substantially driven by fixed asset investment and government spending to one that is consumption driven, that takes time. Um, but there are businesses, there are great businesses, great franchises, similar to ones that you, know, you see in sectors in the US, uh, in Europe, here in Australia. Those businesses, in a lot of cases, are not that dissimilar. But when we look at the businesses, we sit there and say, okay, to us, they are reminisce uh, of some of these businesses we've seen in the Western world, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, so I think there are pockets of the market that you still want to be uh, invested in. But then again, you have to look back and say, okay, this economy is transitioning. And that transitioning is going to have guys that benefit. You mentioned the, the Alibabas, uh, the, the, the Tencents, the Baidu's of the world. And you're going to have businesses that suffer as a consequence to the change. Um, when we sit back and have a look at all the guys that we're invested in and that we're talking to, um, one of the common themes that you're seeing is businesses that operate in you know, commodity type businesses are getting hurt because the government needs to pass through uh, wage increases. Wage increases have been uh, growing significantly in China, 10 to 15% in most provinces, uh, to drive that domestic consumption story. So someone needs to take the brunt of that. And when you've got an economy that's driven by fixed asset investment, most of those businesses are going to be taking the brunt of that. Um, so that's an important thing to, to really uh, highlight, and I think you know, being selective. Uh, the other important point I think in the short term that we really need to pay a lot of attention to is something that was mentioned, which was the, you know, the clampdown on corruption, something that's been playing out for probably 12 to 18, 24 months. Um, and one of the big risks, I think, to uh, a quick turnaround uh, or, you know, or a stabilising of the growth rates in China at these levels uh, is that corruption clampdown. When we talk to a lot of state-owned enterprises, again, the businesses that control the majority uh, of the marketplace and the economy, decision making is becoming very, very hard. People don't want to make decisions because if they're making decisions, they're probably being looked at by someone that sits above them. So while it is very uh, topical to say that there's a lot of stuff happening in terms of policy, that policy has to trickle down to the state level and to guys at you know, the provincial level. Um, and that's to us what is potentially uh, a big risk in terms of you know, this 
this, this Chinese um, stabilisation story. Okay. Well, it sounds like um, it's not all done for China, but there's a few murky days and a few, uh, a few points to work through just yet. So that's a wrap on China.